Hello, everyone, and welcome to our EdMap Predictor webinar. I'm Michael Lawless, Senior Principal Scientist at Simulations Plus. And I am David Miller, uh, Director for AdMet Chem Informatics. We'll be discussing how to improve your compound design and screening using AdMet property prediction and PK simulations. This is a two-part webinar. Today's webinar will focus on medicinal chemistry tools, and tomorrow's webinar will emphasize DMPK tools. The first section, AdMet properties, will be presented at both webinars. An opportunity to ask questions will follow the presentation. Please enter your questions by using the questions pane on your GoToWebinar panel. This webinar is being recorded for playback at our website, www.simulations-plus.com. You can also contact the distributor in your country for feedback or for a recording of the webinar. This first slide uh, is simply an outline of the talk. Uh, so first I'll give a discussion on AdMet property predictions and AdMet predictor. I'll discuss the physical, chemical, and biopharmaceutical module and its models. Uh, then I'll move on to the metabolism model module and their models, such as SIP substrate, non-substrate, sites of metabolism, and human liver microsomal clearance. Uh, then I'll preview our new transporters module in AdMet predictor X. Uh, then I'll turn it over to Dave, and he will discuss the MedChem Studio module, first giving an overview of the tools to organize chemical data and extract SAR patterns. Then he'll move on to classes in our table generation, match molecular pairs, and similarity searching. Then in the final section, David will preview our new AIDD module, which stands for Artificial Intelligence Driven Drug Design. He'll first give an overview of the algorithm, uh, which is, takes rule-based transformations to modify a molecule, and then uses a Pareto optimization selection to select various objective functions, such as an activity model or AdMet properties. And then finally, he'll give an example using AIDD to find analogs with improved AdMet and PK properties. AdMet predictor, as the uh, name uh, implies, uh, calculates AdMet properties to try and simulate PK properties in vivo. This slide gives an overview of what's happening in vivo. So if we take an orally dosed compound, say an uh, immediate release tablet, uh, it will dissolve uh, in the stomach and as it works its way down the GI tract. Since the stomach pH is much lower than the pH in the rest of the GI tract, the pKa of the molecule is very important and is related to the aqueous, aqueous solubility and biorelevant solubility, all models which are in AdMet predictor. As the molecule dissolves in the stomach and then works its way down the GI tract, uh, it can be absorbed into the gut wall. And just as soon as it enters the enterocytes in the gut wall, that's termed the fraction absorbed of the compound. Properties important here are jejunal permeability, transcellular permeability, which is a molecule um, going through, instead of going through cells, it's going between the cells in, in the gut wall, and also log D versus pH, which is related to the permeability of the compound. Then the compound would enter the portal vein and be delivered into the liver, where liver metabolism and hepatic uptake uh, models can be used to uh, examine the uptake and met metabolism in the liver. Once it gets on the other side of the liver, plasma protein binding, blood to plasma concentration ratio, and volume of distribution are important as the compound enters systemic, systemic circulation and can be uh, absorbed into the various tissues. This slide, this uh, little inset here, shows various CP time curves for a molecule at different concentrations that can be simulated in the HTPK module. This slide gives an overview of the eight models in eight modules in AdMet Predictor X. First of all, there's the physical, chemical, and biopharmaceutical module, the metabolism module, and the toxicity modules, which are all in AdMet Predictor 9.5. Our new model is called the transporters module. And all of these uh, models, modules are particularly or specifically made up of artificial neural network ensemble models. 
uh, some are classification models, other are regression models, and uh, there are also atomic uh, models that use atomic descriptors such as our PKA and sites and metabolism model, module, models. Uh, the HTPK module, our HTPK simulation module, uh, will be discussed in tomorrow's webinar. I'll discuss the transporters today, and then David will discuss the artificial, uh, the AIDD module today. Uh, tomorrow's webinar, I'll discuss uh, and uh, demonstrate the AdMet Modeler package. And AdMet Modeler was used to create all the models in here. And then finally, David will talk about MedChem Studio today. Uh, this gives an overview of the models in the uh, physical, chemical, and biopharmaceutical module. Uh, first, we start with the multi-product ionization constants, or PKA predictions. And this model was enhanced several years ago uh, using data from Bayer Pharmaceutical, where they uh, allowed us to use their structures and um, uh, PKA, uh, ex PKA experimental values in order to arrive a new model. And this is one of the best models around. And it's used throughout AdMet predictor. So uh, the ionization uh, descriptors, F cation, F anion, et cetera, uh, are used in many of the models uh, that we'll talk about today. Uh, then we move on to the uh, log P, which is the um, octanol to water uh, partition coefficient. And that contains several thousand uh, molecules and has a very low RMSE. The log D model is the log P at a particular pH. Um, and so it uses the log D model and the PKA predictions uh, to calculate log D. Then there's also an artificial neural network model in there uh, to um, predict some of the coefficients in the equation. Then we have diffusion coefficient and Henry's law constants. Moving over to this box, uh, we have solubility models, which would include aqueous solubility is kind of the base um, model that gives us our native pH. Uh, and then we have uh, models to predict uh, facive and fed gastric and intestinal fluid uh, solubility. And we have a classification model to predict whether the molecule will has a tendency to supersaturate. Pharmacokinetic models include a major clearance classification mechanism, which is the ECCS. So this is the Extended Clearance Classification System. And it comes main, mainly from a paper from Pfizer, where they developed a, a, this system to classify compounds as either being um, uh, the, the major clearance um, mechanism being hepatic uptake, renal, or uh, metabolism. Uh, we also have rat and human plasma protein binding, blood to plasma constant ratio for rat and human, and volume of distribution. So this is a QSAR model. We also have a volume of, mechanistic volume of distribution, which is calculated with the HTPK simulation module. We predict uh, fraction unbound to microsomes. And then we also have several models that are based on this data set from the ECCS. So one model is a ternary model, which will predict uh, if the model's major clearance mechanism is hepatic uptake, renal, or metabolism. And then for permeability, uh, the main one we use is this PEF model, which is a, a human jejunal permeability, and that's used specifically in the HTPK simulation. And then we have various other permeability models here. Okay, so in this next, uh, in the demo, I'd like to show the effect of ionization on solubility. So let me queue up uh, AdMet Predictor here. And uh, we'll just start, this is uh, AdMet Predictor X uh, or AdMet Predictor 10. Uh, we're very close to freezing the code for this. So the um, uh, underlying program looks really good and we're currently working on documentation. And we believe we'll be able to release this uh, near the end of August uh, next month. So I've just highlighted three uh, amino quinazolins. And these compounds are kind of the scaffold for the first phase of, of uh, our first uh, kinase inhibitors that were developed in the uh, late 1990s. And one problem they had with these compounds is they were a little bit, uh, their solubility was fairly low. Uh, under the tools, uh, we have uh, what's called the BCS, DCS Explorer. Uh, so if I click on that, uh, it will uh, uh, use the intrinsic solubility 
and our human jejunal permeability um, model to uh, classify the compounds in the various BCS uh, systems. So when I click OK, up brings the viewer, and we're going to do a 550 and 500 milligram dose. And I can label these doses using this uh, tab here. Uh, so we have three different molecules here, and they all end up in this quadrant here. Uh, so if we look at the um, X uh, axis, this is the dose divided by the solubility. So the higher that number, the lower the uh, solubility of the compound. And these compounds in these two quadrants are classed as, classified as low soluble compounds. Uh, these would be your high soluble compounds. And then on permeability, this is classified as low permeability based on our PEF model and high permeability. So these compounds all fall into class two, which is low solubility and high permeability. Uh, and the way these work uh, when they're dissolving uh, in the GI tract specifically is that uh, only compounds that are in solution can be absorbed. But even though these compounds are low solubility, a little bit of the compound will be uh, dissolved and can immediately uh, be, uh, permeate the cell wall and uh, um, go into the, the, the gut wall. And then that allows more of the compound to dissolve. So this is kind of a sink effect and you can still get fairly high uh, uh, oral bioavailability even from these class two compounds. So let's first take a look at uh, the PKA microstates of this first compound. So I'm in the um, PhysChem properties tab and I can simply double click on um, this column here, which will bring up the uh, microstates for the compound. This compound has three protonatable amines, the exocyclic nitrogen, the N1 nitrogen and the N3 nitrogen of the quinazolin ring. Down at the bottom, all of the um, uh, nitrogens are protonated. And so this would contribute to the solubility and be high solubility. Of course, it's at a very low pH, and in fact, probably not a physical pH. As you increase the uh, pH, uh, one of the protons will drop off, and we preferentially say that the uh, N3 nitrogen will lose its uh, proton first. And this mac microstate is represented by, represents about 83% of the species in this pH ring, range. As we move up further, another proton will disappear. And we predict that the nitrogen N1 of the quinazolin ring has the uh, highest pKa and is therefore protonated. And then as you move above uh, three, uh, you get this uh, neutral ma macrostate, which would be um, um, shown at the high pH. So we can click this button here to put up a fraction ionized versus pH plot. And um, you see this blue line here corresponds to the neutral state, and then it drops down. Uh, if you're in the stomach at a pH of say 1.5, uh, most of the compound is in this plus one state, uh, which would increase the solubility. As far as solubility is concerned, the more ionization of the compound, the higher the solubility of the compound. So now let's look at um, a picture from Gastro Plus, going back to the slides here. Okay, and let's look at the pH in the various GI uh, compartments in the GI tract and the transit time for each of these compartments. So you see in the stomach, the pH is between one and two, maybe about 1.3 according to uh, gastro plus. And then when it passes into the jejunum, the pH shoots up, okay? And then um, uh, as far as the time spend and the fasted state, it spends about 15 minutes in the, the uh, stomach and then 15 minutes in the jejunum all the way down to the ileum. Then when it gets into the cecum and ascending colon, that's where it's really uh, spending quite a bit of time uh, there. So now let's go back into Gastro Plus and let's uh, plot uh, the solubility versus pH. So uh, we can look at uh, uh, this model here. This is the solubility in micrograms per milliliter. And uh, you can see they're all fairly low for these compounds. But then um, in, if we double click on one of these, we can get a display of the solubility versus the pH. 
And we can also display where the pKa is of this compound. As I mentioned, it's a, around four. And uh, as you see, as you get down below there, you start to get an increase in solubility of this particular compound. So let's look uh, back, and this is, would be a gastro plus simulation, uh, where we're uh, dosing this compound at 100 milligrams and looking at the amount dissolved uh, versus the simulation time. So when this compound is in the stomach, uh, the predicted solubility is, at pH 1.3 is 0.46 milligrams per milliliter. And for this 100 milligram dose, that is less than the concentration in the stomach, so the whole dose is not dissolved. And that's shown in this plot here, where less than 50 milligrams uh, is dissolved in this time frame. And then as it works its way down the GI tract, it slowly dissolves. Uh, but as you can see, this results in a fraction absorbed of about 67% for this molecule. So back in the 90s, what they would do is they would add solubilizing groups uh, to these compounds. And so an example of a solubilizing group is illustrated with just this morpholine ring uh, here. So if we look at the pK microstates for this compound, we see that uh, at a pH of 1.52, uh, that most of the compound is in this plus two state. So it's more ionized and will reflect a greater solubility. So again, if we uh, double click on the solubility versus pH profile, you see that this is a higher uh, solubility. And then going back to the uh, presentation here and skipping to this, I plotted both the solubilities on one plot and you see the uh, one with the morpholine ring is much higher at this lower pH and therefore uh, would enhance its solubility. Now, if we um, look at the uh, 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 plot of amount dissolved versus the simulation time for this compound, you see that most of the compound is dissolved about 90, over 90 milligrams, which is over 90% of the dose, is dissolved in, in the stomach in the first 15 minutes. Then as it starts to work down the, its way down the GI tract, it recrystallizes because now we're getting at that higher pH where the solubility goes down. And this is characteristic of a compound that would be soluble in the uh, stomach, but then in the GI tract, it recrystallizes and then slowly uh, dissolves so that it uh, comes up uh, to have a fraction absorbed of uh, almost 100% for that compound. Okay, now moving on to the metabolism module. Uh, this shows all the models in the metabolism module. And these over here are focused on recombinant SIPs and predicting whether it's a substrate or non-substrate, uh, predicting the sites of metabolism. And then for each one of those sites of metabolism, we predict KM, Vmax, and clearance. And then we can kind of combine these in order to make a molecular value of KM, Vmax, and clearance. Uh, we also have a liver microsomal clearance and uh, a rat liver uh, clearance uh, models. Uh, we have five models for different isoforms of cytochrome P450 inhibition, uh, models to predict whether it's a UGT substrate, and we can now visualize these in 9.5. Uh, in 9.5, we added an aldehyde oxidase substrate, non-substrate model, sites of metabolism, metabolites model. So again, you can visualize these metabolites. And then finally, an esterase uh, metabolites model uh, uh, viewer. So our, our recombinant SIPs uh, models kind of work together. And the first thing we do is predict if a compound is a substrate for an isoform. And in this example, I'm only showing the uh, five major uh, drug metabolizing isoforms uh, for this molecule. And it's predicted that four out of the five uh, SIPs, will, uh, this will be a substrate for, for those five, uh, for those SIPs. Uh, next, we predict the sites of metabolism uh, for the uh, isoforms for which it was a substrate. So in this example, I'm showing the 3A4 sites. There would also be one for 2D6 and the other two um, uh, cytochrome P450s. And then finally, we'll predict uh, the clearance for each one of these uh, um, atoms. 
And then you can bring this into uh, MedChem Designer and display the metabolites along with the uh, clearances for the different uh, uh, products or metabolites. Okay, so let's see uh, how that works now in AdMap Predictor. Uh, so if we go to the metabolism module, uh, the first thing you will see are these SIP substrate uh, star plots. So you can very quickly get a feel for uh, which isoforms this is a substrate of. And you see that this is a substrate, predicted substrate of five of the isoforms, just three, and then this bottom compound, only uh, two of the isoforms. If we uh, double click on uh, SIP1A2 sites, uh, it will bring up our atomic property uh, windows displayer and it shows the scores on the molecules as I showed in this uh, slide. We can double click on uh, the structure image to bring it up into uh, MedChem Designer and then we can simply click on the metabolism module uh, here to generate the metabolites of the compound. And uh, in this case, uh, we're hydroxylating across from the nitrogen, uh, and then this can rearrange to form this kind of uh, kind of quinone-like structure here. Uh, similarly, we uh, oxidize the nitrogen at an OH here, and this product is formed by aldehyde oxidase as a prediction here for that uh, compound. And then another hydroxylation uh, prediction here. Uh, then for each of the isoforms, we have its clearance. Uh, if you sum up all the um, clearance values for all the products, you get the overall predicted clearance of the molecule, and then you can take the individual products, sum up their clearance, divide it by the overall clearance to get a percent clearance for each of these. And this would be if this compound went all the way, uh, was completely metabolized by these uh, five SIPs, these would kind of be the percentages you'd see as far as the metabolites are. Uh, we can also go back here and we can display uh, the um, uh, UGT sites. So this, first of all, it runs the UGT models and it predicts that 1A9, 1A1, et cetera, these isoforms, uh, this compound would be a substrate for these various isoforms. And then it would predict also the products uh, from these compounds uh, or from these um, uh, various uh, isoforms here. Then to kind of illustrate the um, uh, uh, esterase models, I'm going to use a, a carbamate. So uh, this model was using uh, data from prodrugs and looking at how prodrugs were metabolized. And so it's a rule-based algorithm uh, that looks at various groups. And even though uh, this is a carbamate, uh, an esterase can metabolize this. And you see that in some prodrugs. Uh, so I would move this down and click on esterase, and then it would generate the products. And there's probably an intermediate in here, which it cleaves this bond here, and you're left with kind of an amide bond, which would decompose into the amine. Okay, now let's shift back to PowerPoint and show some of the uh, models in the transporter module. So regulatory agencies for the past five to 10 years have really been recommending um, that we look at transporters for drug-drug interactions, especially in the US. Uh, people are taking multiple drugs at once and uh, sometimes uh, you take one medicine and it can uh, adversely affect another medicine and um, increase the uh, toxicity effects. Uh, so over on the left, we see a guidance from the US FDA they're talking about PGP and BCRP, OATP1B1 and B3, et cetera. And then the European Medicine, Medicines Agency uh, talks about PGP, which is also known as MDR1, OATP1B1 and 1B3, OCT2, OAT1, OAT3, and BCRP. So these are the seven kind of primary transporters that they're interested in. And then OCT1, MATE1, and MATE2 are kind of secondary and can also be considered. Uh, BCEP is specific for um, uh, uh, drug-induced liver injury. And so some of our colleagues over at DILISIM uh, measure BCEP inhibition uh, in order to, uh, as one of the tools in their QSP uh, models to predict liver um, injury from a drug. 
so we've also included that model in MMF predictor. Uh, so on this slide, we show um, the various uh, tissues and most of the uh, transporters of DDI interest are expressed in the epithelial layer of intestinal uh, and enterocytes, hepatocytes, and kidney uh, proximal tools. Uh, for the intestine, you're looking at PGP and BCRP. So here is kind of the uh, the gut wall, or the excuse me, the lumen of the GI tract, and PGP would pump a compound back into the uh, gut, so it would decrease its absorption uh, into the uh, enterocytes. So if you have a compound that would inhibit PGP, then your compound can uh, ease, more easily be absorbed. For the hepatocytes, uh, we're looking at the, the blood here, and OATP1B1 and 1B3 would transport a molecule into uh, the liver uh, to be metabolized. For the kidneys, OAT1 and OAT3 and OCT2 uh, would transport compounds into the uh, proximal tools where it would be cleared uh, via the kidneys in the urine. And uh, if you um, compound as a substrate for, say, OAT1 and you co dose it with um, uh, an inhibitor, then you could potentially increase the um, uh, concentration of the first drug and potentially uh, see toxicity effects. And some examples are shown on this slide. So uh, in this table, we show the interacting drug. So this would be the uh, co-dose compound. I think this would be, um, uh, the, I think this is called the uh, victim and this is the perpetrator. So uh, in these first three rows, you see digoxin, which is a PGP substrate. So if you dose it with quinidine, which is a uh, PGP inhibitor, you see the digoxin uh, exposure go up by 1.7 fold for rifampicin, which is a PGP inducer. So this is gonna create more PGP uh, proteins in the, in the gut wall, and you would decrease the digoxin exposure. Uh, drone drone is a PGP inhibitor. Uh, so here you would see an increase in exposure of digoxin if it's co-dosed with drone drone. Um, so this is a, a list of the models in uh, ADMET Predictor X. Uh, so we've developed several KM models for PGP and BCRP. Uh, these are efflux transporters and obtaining the data is very difficult. Uh, we're trying, we tried creating models, but in this first release, we won't have KM models for these two transporters, but we will have KM models for these other six transporters. Uh, then uh, substrate, non-substrate models, uh, will include PGP, BCRP, which these two models were an ABMAP predictor 9.5. We rebuilt the PGP substrate model, uh, kind of modifying the data or using different data. Uh, we're going to keep the one that was an ABMAP predictor 9.5, and then we've created these six new models. For um, inhibitors, uh, we rebuilt the PGP and uh, OATP1B1. We're using the OCT. Uh, the model from 9.5 for both OCT2 and BCEP. And then for IC50s, currently we only have uh, the BCEP model there. And these model, these KM uh, predictions could be used, for example, in a PBPK simulation, looking at drug-drug interactions, uh, where you would you maybe use our predicted KM and then optimize the uh, VMAX uh, with some experimental data. Um, this slide simply shows the uh, regression models and the um, uh, various statistics. Uh, these are fairly small data sets for us, but um, you know we're, we, we really curated these heavily and we are confident that uh, uh, these um, uh, experimental data is, is, is correct. And uh, uh, we've created some very nice models uh, for these somewhat smaller data sets. Uh, this next slide shows our substrate, non-substrate models, uh, including the statistics for all of these. Uh, you see the concordance, sensitivity, and specificity are all above 80% for all of the uh, substrate, non-substrate models. And then in this final slide, um, we show the uh, statistics for the inhibitors, uh, the concordance, sensitivity, and specificity, which are all above 80%. And these models, some of these are, are fairly large data sets and um, should give you good predictions. 
So um, I don't have a lot to demo on this. We do have a, a tab now for the transporters module. Uh, in this uh, beta release, we didn't uh, input all the, or we didn't have all the models, uh, but I added these as user models here. And so you see the BCRP substrate inhibition, IC50, KM, et cetera, models. And I've classed, classed these together as uh, far as their families, uh, but everything looks, um, you know, it's looking pretty good. And um, this will be in the final uh, product. All right. So that is it for my slides. I'm going to turn it over to David and he'll walk you through uh, MedChem Designer and AIDD. Thank you very much, Michael. You're welcome. Okay. And I see you're the presenter. Okay, so I see your screen, uh, your PowerPoint slide. And okay, just there you go. Yep. Okay, great. All right, so um, continuing on here, we're about a third of the way through. As Michael said, um, we're going to take a little time to talk about uh, a module of AbMet Predictor that's probably a little less well known, um, not uh, oriented around predicting properties, but more of a collection of tools for medicinal chemists um, in the very early stages of drug discovery. Um, I will then uh, give a preview of um, a feature we're calling AIDD, which Michael alluded to, um, which we're expecting to be um, released in about a month or so. I should say ahead of time that we are planning a um, not only a full seminar on the AdMet Predictor 10 release, uh, but a separate webinar on uh, the AIDD feature. Uh, so today's um, presentation will be pretty brief on that. Um, so the MedChem Studio module um, is essentially a collection of uh, chem informatics tools. These were brought in several years ago from a separate product and integrated into the AdMet Predictor software. Um, among the tools are um, clustering. This is uh, useful in situations where you have a relatively large set of compounds that are structurally diverse. Um, there's a focus on uh, clustering by common scaffold. Um, there's a feature to generate R tables uh, and quite a few uh, visual features to help analyze those R tables. Uh, there's a max molecular pair uh, feature. Um, matched molecular pairs are sometimes uh, referred to as activity cliffs. Um, a number of features related to similarity and diversity. Um, some somewhat qualitative structure activity relationship features. Uh, these um, contrast with the quantitative uh, models that you can build with our modeler software. I think um, Michael will, uh, may touch on that separate module tomorrow, the AdMet modeler uh, module. Um, and then finally, there are some tools um, to help you design virtual compounds. Okay. Um, I'm just going to walk through a few of these features here. Um, there are quite a few uh, separate methods for organizing compounds into families or classes. Most of them are based on uh, these two steps. Uh, the first is to take this uh, presumably large set of diverse compounds and partition the compounds into fragments. Um, the type of fragment uh, that you generate will depend on the uh, particular class generation method that you've selected. Um, the second step is to select from among those fragments uh, a subset that will be used to um, form classes. And this is an example of, of two classes shown here. Um, I want to just uh, highlight one class generation method in particular. Um, we refer to it as the frameworks method. Um, it derives from a literature method from Bemis and Merco um, from something like 14 years ago. Um, it's a relatively simple uh, uh, procedure uh, in which a compound um, is pruned such that all uh, degree one atoms are iteratively removed from the compound so that you're left with only ring systems and chains that connect those ring systems together. Uh, and then in our version, um, there's the option to keep um, just the largest uh, ring system to throw away the other 
rings and the chains that connect them. Um, this is actually the default method of class generation in AdMet Predictor um, for the reasons that it is extremely fast, uh, even on very large data sets. Um, the compounds, each compound can produce only one fragment in this procedure. So each compound ends up in only one class, which makes it a little easier uh, to analyze the results. Um, and the scaffolds themselves uh, are intuitive um, from the standpoint of a chemist. It's just something that um, is very common uh, for representing compounds that way. And I'll have a chance to give a, a brief demo on this um, using a pretty large data set. Um, once you have generated classes, um, there are several ways to view the data in Predictor. There's a classes tab uh, in which each row um, represents a single class. Uh, the common scaffold for the class is highlighted. Um, one compound from the class is chosen to be represented in the spreadsheet, and by default, it's the lowest molecular weight compound. Um, I mentioned R tables, so here we're showing uh, an R table scaffold for each class. Uh, and then, of course, you can have various uh, statistics for the compounds in each class, um, like averages of either experimental or predicted properties, uh, histograms, etc. cetera. Um, there are a number of ways to look at R tables. One is to, you know, look at essentially the classic um, column-based table that you would see in a JMED Chem article. Um, but another sort of powerful tool um, is to display what we call the R group analyzer. Um, and among its features is one in which you can show all of the uh, substituents at one R position uh, against all the substituents at another uh, R position. Um, this is a simple case with only two R groups in total. So here it's just all the R1s against all the R2s. Um, uh, you can see immediately the compounds or the, uh, the combinations of substituents that are not actually represented in your data set. So those would show as blank cells, uh, whereas the circles would indicate um, compounds that you have colored by a property that you select. And here it's an IC50 value. So the green compounds would be the most active and the red the least active. Um, there's quite a bit you can do uh, inside this uh, view. Um, and I'll see if I can uh, show an example of that in a few minutes. Um, there's a separate tab for looking at uh, pairs. I referred to that um, a few minutes ago. So you can take a data set and automatically discover um, what many people refer to as activity cliffs. Um, one of the nice things about this view um, is that for a particular pair of compounds, the software automatically aligns them um, by what it perceives to be the largest set of atoms and bonds that are shared by the pair of compounds. And then it's also able to um, color with highlighting uh, the regions of the compound that are mismatched. So you can see here um, a fluorine on the left and a chlorine on the right. Um, when you generate pairs, the ones at the top uh, are the ones with the um, smallest change in chemical structure, uh, but the largest change in some property that you specify ahead of time. So this, in this particular example, we're looking at activity. Um, yeah, so there's um, an activity column for the left hand, um, the, the structures in the left hand column and the activity for the structures in the right and the difference in activity here. So these two compounds uh, are very uh, structurally similar, they just differ by the one atom, um, but the IC50s are very different. So they are um, about 1.5 um, different. Um, so you're able to quickly see sort of those kind of hot spots or, or regions of sensitivity um, in your chemical structures. So I'll, I'll try to have a chance to show this as well in a few minutes. Um, within that pairs tab, there's also a feature to perform clustering on the pairs themselves. So here, what you're looking at is a subset of the pairs that you've discovered, and they all represent the exact same uh, chemical transform, if you will. So on the left, um, the compounds all have a methyl group uh, that has been transformed on the right to a hydroxyl group. 
Um, and then what you can do is, you know, taking only these pairs into account, look at um, the distribution of a particular property that you select. And here, this is an experimentally determined solubility value. Um, so you see that for all these examples of changing methyl to hydroxyl, um, they tend to be um, uh, matched with a corresponding increase in the experimental solubility, which is what you would expect. Um, so using this kind of tool as a way to derive certain rules, um, and there are ways actually in AbMet Predictor that those rules can be used, uh, such as with compound design. And I'll talk about design um, in a minute. Um, there are a number of fingerprint methods uh, in the MedChem module. Um, ECFP keys is one uh, such fingerprint type. Um, and this is a window that um, is kind of getting at this qualitative SAR idea uh, that you can identify um, fragments like the one highlighted here and show a plot where the red bars are the activity distribution of the subset of compounds that contains this highlighted fragment. And you can see that it's um, shifted to the right relative to the um, activity distribution of the compounds that do not have that particular fragment. And this was found automatically. You know, it, I think, probably sorts the, the spreadsheet, um, you know, to find those uh, fragments for which this uh, phenomenon is the most dramatic. Um, so, again, this is, you know, it's a qualitative SAR feature, um, less powerful, of course, than our... Um, our engine for building QSAR models. Um, but chemists often find this to be intuitive, um, easy to use, uh, and quite interpretable. Um, whereas, you know, the highly complex models that we generate are sometimes less easy to, uh, to interpret. Um, getting on to similarity, um, there's, of course, a way in the software to search within uh, the data set that you are examining, you know, to take a compound and find similar ones. Uh, but there is also a feature to search using a reference compound against a external library of compounds. We use the term library um, for that. So in Predictor, you can take uh, a structure file, like an SD file, that represents typically a large set of compounds. And this could be a corporate collection, um, something like the Kemble database, uh, some other literature collection, for example. Um, and AdMet Predictor lets you format that structure file in such a way that subsequently it can be searched very quickly um, to find similar hits uh, to a reference compound. Um, so here it brings back um, compounds from the library that are most similar to the compound that we started with. Um, and you can view the results in that same uh, pairs tab that I uh, showed on a, a few slides back. And that has the virtue of um, aligning the compound structurally and uh, uh, highlighting the structural differences so that they're very easy to see. Um, I think I'll have a chance to show this in a bit. Um, there are a few design features. So this is, um, these are features to create virtual libraries uh, in AdMet Predictor. Um, one of them uses uh, an actual reaction scheme that you sketch, um, for example, using our, our sketch tool that Michael showed. Um, so this is an example of, um, of amidines and nitriles going to triazoles. Um, this was drawn with designer. You specify uh, reactant files, one for uh, each of the um, reagents, and then Predictor will uh, combine them to create that virtual library. Um, there's a similar feature that uses just a sketched scaffold as opposed to a reaction scheme. So here, um, you would just draw a scaffold with R groups, uh, and then for each of those groups, specify the substituents that you want to use. Um, again, these can be drawn with designer or some other sketch tool, uh, and then Predictor will explode that virtual library for you. Um, and then there's a, a somewhat more complex um, virtual design tool uh, that is based on, on rules. 
Um, now this, the inspiration for this um, was originally a presentation from Abbott Labs, um, a guy named uh, Kent Stewart. Um, the software at Abbott was called Drug Guru. And this was software that would allow a chemist to take a lead structure and apply to it a essentially database of chemical transformations. Um, in that software, the transformations really did represent reactions. So these were, you know, like validated reactions in use uh, at Abbott at the time. And it would allow a chemist to sort of explore, you know, what are the possible derivatives that I could make um, knowing that, you know, there's someone at this company who's going to help me know how to make it, you know, because these, these um, transforms were all input by, by Abbott scientists and um, there was some expertise behind them. Um, we took that idea and, and just generalized it to have the transform rules be more generic. So not necessarily tied to a particular reaction, um, but representing things like um, bioisosteric uh, replacements uh, or even just what you might call mutations. In other words, like changing carbon to nitrogen, for example, um, but doing that in a what we call chemically intelligent way. So avoiding, you know, making compounds that would be unstable, uh, you know, potentially toxic or otherwise undesirable. Um, so, but otherwise it's a similar tool. You input one or more structures and then by applying these rules, you create a set of derivatives from it. Um, I wanted in particular to um, spend a minute talking about this because it does have bearing on the, uh, the AIDD section um, that we'll talk about uh, in about 15 minutes or so. <clears throat> Oh yeah, there's just one more slide. Um, this is the user interface for, for that feature um, presented on the previous slide, uh, just showing that you can further restrict uh, the analogs that you generate by specifying a scaffold uh, that every uh, created analog has to contain. And that can be a Marcouche um, you know, scaffold that has sort of points of variability and um, positions where you're not allowed to make substitutions, things like that. Um, this is drawn using our designer software as well. Um, and then you can also specify a arbitrary set of filter criteria. Um, these are often fragments that you just never want to see in any compound that it generates. Um, so this will come up again during the AIDD part um, in a few minutes. Um, but first I'm going to um, put the slides away and just spend a few minutes um, showing a couple examples that highlight uh, MedChem Studio features. Okay, so this is the same beta version of APX that Michael showed. Um, I'm gonna start by opening an SD file. Um, this is a relatively large set of compounds, about 16,000. Um, there's a, a primary uh, assay value there. It's a percent inhibition value. So think of this data set as representing maybe the results of an HTS screen. It's pretty diverse um, and fairly large. Okay, so those open up in predictor. We'll make the rows a little bigger. Um, let's see, I can show the percent inhibition value in the um, histogram here. So um, you have a lot of diverse data here. Um, you can certainly sort on activity and sort of browse uh, some of the more active compounds. But if your interest is in finding a chemical series uh, that may be worth pursuing, uh, it's very useful to be able to organize these compounds uh, into families, uh, particularly if it is done by common scaffold. Um, so I will run that uh, feature using the frameworks method that we um, talked about in the slides. So this is about, again, 16,000 compounds. And it only takes, I don't know, maybe four or five seconds um, to cluster these. Okay, now to view the, the classes, we activate the uh, classes tab, which is what is what was shown in the um, slides. Okay, so the software you know, now is showing one uh, chemical family or class uh, per row with the common core or scaffold uh, highlighted. Um, the method further organizes the classes, sort of a first level organization, 
so that you see that the uh, first few classes are um, single ring aromatic scaffolds and then if you scroll down a bit you see bicyclics um, so it does do some organization um, let me get rid of the molecular weight histogram uh, and make that a um, activity histogram okay so this is the percent inhibition uh, value here so there are a lot of tools um, in the software for sort of analyzing these classes. There's quite a few classes here because it was a big data set. Um, one of the features that can be used um, is under the classes menu. It's called prioritize. Okay, so again, because of the short time frame, I'm not going to be able to explain every option on every dialogue that I show, unfortunately. But um, if I select a property, I'll select our percent inhibition value, um, you can assign weights to a variety of properties here. Things like how many compounds uh, would I want in an interesting class? How complex should the scaffold be? Now, presumably we're interested in something more complex than benzene, for example. Um, you know, should there be a lot of active compounds, perhaps a range of activity values and so on. Um, I'm going to have to just run it um, in the interest of time here, but you'll see it brings to the top a, a bicyclic scaffold, um, not super large, but about 77 compounds uh, in it. Um, there is a range of activity here. I can show it a little more clearly over here if I click this button. The red bars are the activities for just the selected class. So you see there are some compounds um, that, are, that are quite active here. Um, so it looks like a you know fairly interesting uh, class. Um, if you generate an R table for the class, you can see sort of what's the diversity of the compounds within the class. Here we're just looking at you know the lowest molecular weight compound, but actually there's there's quite a bit of variability um, in the class. There's actually five R groups here. Um, there are tools to let you drill down further into a class to look for interesting subclasses. I'll just briefly show that. Um, this is another example of a fairly powerful dialogue that I can't fully explain here. Um, but if I select our percent inhibition value and just ask it to look for interesting subclasses, um, the first one that it finds um, is one that's smaller. It has 16 compounds uh, from the original uh, 77. And you see it only has two R groups here. So we've essentially locked R group two uh, as carbonyl and R3 and R4 as hydrogen. So there are 16 compounds that have those particular substituents at those uh, positions. So you're left with just two points of variability now. Um, but we've, we've retained the activity. So the active compounds are in this, in this subset. Um, so we've kind of gotten rid of some of the perhaps less interesting uh, compounds um, that don't satisfy this particular motif. And now, you know, you could go into the R table, um, view uh, the R group analyzer and look more, you know, finally, more closely at the particular substituents that are here and, and see whether it may be a, a chemical series worth pursuing. Um, rather than do that, I'm going to open up a different data set. Um, it's sort of something to represent a more focused um, kind of an SAR data set as opposed to an HTS, uh, but it's built around this um, this core here. So I'll just open up that second file. So this is going to be only about 500 uh, compounds, and instead of being highly diverse, it's actually highly homogeneous. Um, so the compounds are, are very structurally similar. Um, so in some ways we have the reverse scenario from the previous one. Um, there are two activities in this data set, kind of arbitrarily called A and B. Um, they're PIC50s. I'll just plot them A against B down here. So even though the data set is small and the set is pretty homogeneous, um, it's still helpful to organize the data into chemical families. Um, so I'll use the same approach as before and then activate the classes tab. So in this you know, rather congeneric um, set of compounds, there are actually only four uh, scaffolds total, about uh, equal size. Um, the cores, if you look carefully, are highly related to one another, uh, slightly different. Um, again, I'll get rid of this molecular weight 
um, histogram and put the activities here. So one class has very few actives against either target and the other three classes have uh, quite a few active compounds in them. Um, now there's a lot we could do here. I wanted to highlight one feature in particular that becomes kind of interesting in this scenario where you have uh, multiple uh, classes that are structurally related to one another. And that is to uh, create a combined class um, with a Marcouche scaffold that captures the um, sort of the point variabilities among these four different scaffolds. The things you can do um, that are kind of interesting when you have such a Marcouche superclass. Um, to do that, there's a few ways to do it. Um, I think the easiest is just to say combine. So combine these four classes, but save the originals. So I have a new superclass here. Um, I can generate a scaffold for that uh, superclass and you see that it, you'll see that it's a Marcouche scaffold um, once I generate R tables for all these classes. So these are the R tables that I get, and they all have just two points of, um, of variability on them. Um, for the Marcouche class, you can see that within the scaffold, it designates the points uh, at which there is variability within the scaffold. Um, so there's one star symbol here where you can see that atom can be ar either car a carbon or nitrogen. And the same is true for this atom, it can be carbon or nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen. Um, for a class like this, um, you can still use the R table features uh, in Predictor. Um, so I'll launch the uh, R group analyzer uh, feature that I showed in the slide section. And I'll activate that matrix view. Um, where I showed a slide for. So now, um, again, this is a simple case of just two R groups. So we're looking at all the possible R1s within our entire data set, all the possible R2s within our entire data set. Um, so what's different here is that in the interior, um, there are some cells where there are uh, now kind of four wedges here. Before we were looking at circles inside in the slide. But now a particular combination of R groups may be represented up to four times because we have four different scaffolds. Um, so this is a view that really packs a lot of information into it. You know, when you consider we're looking at um, an additional dimension here, the scaffold dimension along with the two, uh, the two R group dimensions. Um, you can again, you know, sort to put the actives um, in one side and the inactives on the other. This is one of the activities. Um, and then you can also navigate through the specific scaffolds. So it knows you know, what the exact scaffolds are. This is the Marcouche representation. But if I, I can navigate through and see, you know, this is the representation for this scaffold, next scaffold, um, next scaffold. Um, I can add a second activity here. And um, let's see, I think I did that wrong. I went B. Um, and for this scaffold, you can see more uh, selective compounds where there's green color for the PIC50A and more reddish color for the B. So this is actually the, the class that has the most selective compounds. You can see that if I navigate through. So again, um, quite a bit you can do with a, with a tool like this. I'm gonna have to leave class generation here. Check the clock really quick. Um, let me just show a pairs feature um, really quick. So I mentioned um, there's an automatic way to discover uh, pairs of compounds that are very structurally uh, similar, uh, but that um, differ with respect to some property that you select. I'll just quickly um, show that using um, selectivity uh, as the attribute. I don't have that attribute um, now, but I can create it um, using an equation. It's just PIC50A minus B. Let's call it selectivity. So I've added it. Um, I can just show it as a color. It'd be very intuitive to see the green being the compounds with the high A activity but lower B activity. Um, I could now uh, generate pairs where I say that selectivity is my property and I only want to see uh, pairs if the difference in selectivity uh, between the two compounds is at least one. Uh, so that's essentially one order of magnitude more active for A over B. Um, there's, there's similarity threshold information here um, that I, I 
just can't really find time to describe, but um, it's all in the manual, I should point out. If I activate the pairs tab, um, now we can view that information. So at the uh, top are pairs of compounds that are most structurally similar, um, but that have a large uh, difference in cell activity. So it's a little hard to see, but there are example pairs where the only difference between the molecules is a methyl group. Uh, but there's a very significant change uh, in terms of preference for target A over B. And this can be done with any property, um, activity, um, cell activity, or, or uh, a predicted property like admit property. And then finally, this will be really fast, um, the library screening feature. So that's taking a, a compound of interest and then doing a similarity search, not internally against this um, set of compounds, but against an external, uh, essentially a database. We use the term library. So I have um, used AdMet Predictor to convert the entire Kemble database, that's about a million and a half structures, uh, into um, that library format. It was less than an hour um, to, do, to create this. You only do it once. Um, and then now I can search against it. So that search um, it does use multiple threads, but it, it's very fast, just a couple seconds um, to search. And then it brings up a new window uh, where the original compound is here, Kemble hits uh, are here, and you can view them in that same um, pairs tab that I mentioned where the left uh, column is always the reference compound, the right is a Kemble compound, most similar ones at the top, uh, aligned by structure uh, with differences highlighted. Um, so you see a methoxy group um, on the left, chlorine group on the right. So this can be a very you know, convenient feature for you know, searching whether a particular compound of interest is contained in some reference set, corporate collection, you know, patent collection, whatever it may be. Okay, that was a very fast tour um, through the uh, MedChem features. I've left out the design features because that's um, kind of a segue to our next topic here, which is gonna be AIDD. Okay, um, Michael already gave a kind of a brief introduction to this. Um, this is really a tool for uh, evolutionary multi-objective compound optimization. Again, this is uh, AIDD stands for Artificial Intelligence Driven Drug Design. Um, as Michael said, we're targeting next month for the release of Admet Predictor X. Um, there are a number of new features. Uh, a few of them are listed here. Um, and as I mentioned, of course, we'll have a full webinar on APX um, in the coming months. So um, one of the features is that the predicted uh, properties are now, um, uh, that, that prediction is performed in parallel now. Still on, on a single machine, but uh, if you have a multi-core uh, machine, it will take advantage um, and it will run those uh, predictions in multiple threads. And that applies both to our AdMet property prediction uh, as well as to the HTPK uh, simulation. Um, we've added uh, quite a few uh, models and improved others and those span across uh, the various modules, uh, the PhysChem, metabolism, and toxicity. Um, Michael already discussed the transporters uh, module. Um, we may have an entire webinar uh, just devoted to that. Um, we have improved uh, the HTPK feature uh, quite a bit, and this was done in collaboration with a pharma partner. Um, that's a collaboration that's actually ongoing. Um, so we're working on the next round of enhancements to HTPK. Um, and then finally, the AIDD feature. Um, this slide really is um, meant to talk about one of the motivations for the development of AIDD. Um, our company as a whole, you know, is assembling, you know, quite a, a pipeline of tools um, that span from predicting properties from structure, and that's AdMet Predictor, uh, to advanced pharmacokinetic simulations with GastroPlus, to advanced um, quantitative systems toxicology uh, models with DILISIM. Um, and AIDD was in part um, to take some of the results from those more advanced um, 
uh, simulations and use them to inform uh, decisions about compound design. Um, so sort of complete this feedback loop, if you will. Use results of more advanced downstream tools to help guide uh, decisions uh, as far as compound synthesis goes. Okay, this is the same slide essentially that I showed um, maybe 10 slides back. So this is again the feature from the MedChem module to generate analogs using a database of uh, transform rules. Okay, so this was an existing feature. The AIDD methodology um, builds upon uh, that same idea of transform-based analog generation. Um, but we have spent a significant amount of time uh, expanding and improving the rules themselves, uh, making them a lot more um, specific, um, avoiding you know, the making of undesirable uh, products and, and just adding a lot more chemistry. Um, of course, this feature incorporates our predicted properties. Um, I'll talk more about this as we go on, but these can include ADMET properties, uh, HTPK simulation results, uh, our various risk models, and any activity models that have been built by the user with our ADMET modeler software. And I, I think Michael will have a chance to talk more about ADMET modeler tomorrow. Uh, it also incorporates uh, our synthetic difficulty scoring. So this is a feature we, we added um, several versions back. I actually have a slide um, to just kind of give a review of what that score is. But the purpose is to avoid making compounds that are too, um, too complex, too, too difficult to make. Um, and then this whole uh, process is iterative. Um, so for each uh, generation um, within, this, within this algorithm, we uh, retain only the analogs that are Pareto optimal uh, in the space that the user um, selects. This will become more clear um, as the slides go on here. I have a few background slides just to kind of orient everyone to what I'm talking about. Um, I'll skip this one because Michael showed this. So this is uh, meant to um, kind of introduce the HTPK module. I think Michael will say more about it tomorrow. I just wanted to highlight in particular fraction absorbed and fraction bioavailable are the two properties uh, that we're interested in. Um, just uh, Michael will probably show this slide tomorrow as well, but um, just to highlight that the HTPK, this, it's not a model in the sense of our, you know, like our solubility model or our log P model. Um, this is a, a mechanistic simulation um, comprised of two components. Let me get my pointer back here. Um, what we call the ACAT component to model the absorption phase, you know, where the uh, digestive tract is partitioned into various compartments. Um, and then second, uh, a compartmental model uh, to handle the elimination phase. So this is all represented by a series of differential equations, which we solve, and then from that extract um, important PK parameters, uh, like fraction absorbed and fraction bioavailable. Uh, so again, stay tuned tomorrow for more information on that. But since I'm talking about it, I thought I ought to at least include a little something uh, on it. Um, similarly, with ADMET risk, um, I'm not sure Michael was able to get to that in the first section, um, but ADMET predictor uh, generates a number of risk scores. Uh, ADMET risk in particular um, evaluates uh, a lot of major risks across absorption, metabolism, uh, toxicity, and pharmacokinetics. Uh, it's implemented as a set of rules that the user can uh, adjust. Um, some people think of this uh, as being similar, at least in flavor, to Lipinski's rule of five, um, but a lot more complex. Um, the rules have thresholds uh, that are set um, using uh, the World Drug Index, um, so that most commercial drugs uh, pass and, and don't get uh, penalized in this ADMET risk. Um, so overall, this is a uh, it's a score that lets chemists evaluate uh, many different risk factors with just one number. It's particularly useful um, in the AIDD sense, um, you know, where we want to overall limit the, um, the uh, ADMET profile of the compounds that we um, generate. Okay, just a couple more kind of background slides before I put it all together here. Um, this is just a review of what our synthetic difficulty score is. 
uh, based on a publication by Peter Ertl um, in which chemists were asked to assign uh, scores between zero and or one and ten uh, to compounds, um, the scores representing how difficult the chemist thought it would be to synthesize that compound. And then Ertl's method was to use a fragment dictionary as well as some uh, uh, some more heuristic rules, things like you know, uh, you know, like the number of um, stereocenters and 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 whatnot, uh, to try to reproduce that uh, that chemist's ranking, and they actually do a pretty decent job of it. Um, we essentially implemented that method um, from the paper, and that uh, score can be used now um, in our AIDD runs. Uh, and then finally, I mentioned Pareto analysis, so just a simple um, schematic to illustrate what I'm talking about here. This is um, a simple case of two dimensions, and you suppose that we're interested in minimizing um, both of these two properties here. So these might be risks, uh, for example. So we want uh, a low value for this risk on the x axis or the y axis and a low value um, for the other risk as well. So the compounds that are um, colored orange are considered Pareto optimal uh, in the sense that for each of these, there does not exist any compound that is better in both dimensions. There may be a compound better in one dimension, but not a compound in both. And that same cannot be said about the compounds that are colored blue, for which there may be many compounds that are better in both dimensions. So the orange are what we call the first Pareto layer. If we remove those compounds, we could repeat the process, um, select those um, Pareto optimal compounds, and that would be what we call the second layer. So this is a technique that we use um, during the selection phase of AIDD to prune a population of compounds down to a smaller size. We're essentially um, eliminating compounds that are not on the Pareto surface. Okay, so that was a lot of sort of background slides there. And this is the putting it all together slide. Um, so the overall workflow is to select one or more uh, compounds um, to be your initial population. You also choose a set of objectives, all right? So these are, are properties that you wanna optimize. And then there's, um, you, you begin a cycle, essentially. You first generate new compounds using the uh, database of transforms that I discussed earlier. Um, then you evaluate the properties of those uh, compounds, of, of, of the entire population that you have now after the, after the um, creation phase. Again, these can be ADMET properties, uh, FAFB risks, or user models. And then you prune that population back um, by keeping only the ones that are uh, Pareto optimal um, in the sense that I just described. And then with that smaller population, you begin the cycle again. So you generate new compounds from that population, generate their properties, and then again, prune uh, that larger population back again. And this can be repeated for you know, a large number of generations uh, that's determined by the user. Um, we've benchmarked it um, and it, the current moment, you know, this is with parallelization, um, you can evaluate on the order of 10 million uh, compounds in about a day on an eight core machine. Um, this is, I'll, I think I'll mainly skip this slide because I'll, I'll try to show this. Um, this is just showing what the interface looks like with the selection of properties and scaffold. Um, let me just stop here because I think we're down to maybe the last 15 minutes like to leave a little time for slides. Um, I mean, for sorry, for questions. So let me kill this. And I will launch Predictor again and just give a really short um, demo of that feature. This is an example that I can run um, pretty quickly. Okay, so here I'm gonna uh, open just one compound here. So this is a um, example taken from the literature. So um, this is from a JMED Chem article um, that was looking at uh, JAK inhibitors, uh, rheumatoid arthritis project, uh, Pfizer was the company. Um, this particular compound was a lead compound with uh, good activity. It was actually against a spectrum of, um, of, of, of uh, uh, JAKs. Um, I think it was one in three, um, but it had a, um, it, it was unstable. Uh, metabolically, 
So the paper discussed um, trying to find compounds that retain the activity, but that had a better ADME profile. Um, and I should point out that they had identified a region of the compound as being important for activity. And so the, um, the analogs that were uh, pursued in the article all focused on a particular side chain. And that's what I'll do here as well. Um, I'm gonna bring the compound over to designer because I can make the compound a little bit bigger over here. Um, the other sort of change that I'm making here is that rather than focusing on metabolic stability directly, um, because I wanna focus on the use of HTPK within AIDD, uh, I'm going to use um, predicted bioavailability uh, as a surrogate for metabolic stability. Um, so I can run the HTPK simulation um, from designer as well as from predictor. Um, so I'm running it in human um, and I'll just somewhat arbitrarily choose a dose of 10 milligrams. Um, there's a lot of options here and I think Michael probably will, will cover some of these tomorrow, but I'll just run it. Um, predict a few properties here. The fraction absorbed is high Fraction bioavailable, not so high. Um, so we'll see if we can use the AIDD feature um, to improve predicted bioavailability. So I'll launch that tool. I apologize, it's probably a little hard to see this um, with my screen resolution here. I'm gonna pick three properties. Um, the synthetic difficulty score that I mentioned, just to keep the compounds uh, from, prevent them from being too complex. Um, our uh, predicted bioavailability, now here a window opens up where you can select species and dose. Um, and I'll select our admet risk um, just to keep the you know, overall admet profile looking reasonable. Um, you do have to specify a direction, whether you're maximizing or minimizing. Usually that's done uh, automatically here. So we're minimizing synthetic difficulty and admet risk, maximizing um, bioavailability. Um, I have a scaffold that I've drawn. This is drawn using MedChem Designer as well. I can just show that quickly. It's a pretty powerful sketch tool here. Um, you can use another sketch tool as well. Here, you know, I'm essentially locking down the part that uh, Pfizer had determined to be, you know, critical for activity and allowing substitutions out here. Um, if you happen to know the Daylight Smarts language, you can also use that. A um, little more tedious, but actually quite powerful in terms of being able to very precisely control um, the compounds that end up getting generated. Um, we will have a file that we distribute with um, some other rules to prevent you know, certain substructures from appearing uh, in the generated analogs. Um, most of these are taken from literature. You can modify this, uh, add your own rules, uh, elect not to use this at all, um, it's quite flexible. Um, the database of transforms themselves, you can modify those uh, directly, um, should you be brave enough. Um, there's also a widget in which you can sort of see the various transforms that we have, um, not so much their definition, but at least the name, and you can turn them on or off. Um, so for example, you know, you don't want you know, you don't want to add iodine groups or nitro groups, for example, you can disable those. Um, one of the most important parameters is how long it's going to run. Um, I mentioned we've experimented uh, with quite long runs, um, you know, runs that take overnight. Um, I'll do one that can finish in about 60 seconds here. So I'll just select four generations. Uh, there are other parameters here that we'll get into in a subsequent webinar. Um, some of it is, you know, kind of controlling the sizes of the various populations that are created. Um, so the thing is running, um, just to recap the process, again, we're taking the starting compound, creating analogs from it using a, um, this list of transform rules. For that new population then, we're predicting properties um, and then using this, uh, this Pareto optimization strategy to eliminate some of those uh, compounds, the ones that are not um, on the Pareto surface, so to speak. And then with that resulting population, we then start over. Then we take it, generate analogs from it, and that does involve some random selection of both compounds and transforms uh, to, to apply to it. Uh, we, in that sense, grow the population again, predict uh, the properties of that larger population, and then prune it back down again 
uh, using the Pareto analysis. And then that continues on um, for the user specified number of generations. Um, it does uh, do a, there's, there's a prediction phase for the final set of compounds. Um, and then the compounds are shown in a separate um, AdMet predictor window. So when the window opens, um, you see uh, the original compound that we started with and then uh, the list of analogs. Um, in the chart, we see two of the dimensions that we specified. So on the, X, on the Y axis here, we have AdMet risk. On the X axis, uh, the predicted bioavailability. Um, I just want to point out one thing you notice um, right away is that the compound, the distribution doesn't look particularly Pareto optimal. Um, there's a, kind of a cloud of points. And the reason for that is that we did such a short run. Um, I mentioned there are other parameters like, you know, we specified that the population size had to be at least 500 compounds. But with such a small number of cycles, um, it wasn't able to find 500 compounds that were Pareto optimal. If you run this for 10 generations or 20, um, you'll see something that looks much more like a Pareto surface. Um, segue to a feature that we've added um, in Predictor 10, which is to um, just do a Pareto selection within the current spreadsheet. And I'll just illustrate that by selecting um, two of the properties, the ones that are shown in this scatter plot here. So bioavailability and admit risk, if I just select the Pareto optimal compounds directly, um, you'll see there are four of them uh, here. So the compounds on the surface. Um, and just for simplicity, I'll hide everything else. So we're left with compounds that have a pretty good admit risk um, and all of them have a, a really high predicted oral bioavailability. Um, this compound in particular um, magically happens to be the one from the Pfizer paper. This is tofacitinib. Um, the commercial uh, jack inhibitor. I'm just going to select that compound and bring it back to designer or I'll paste it and just um, so you can see side by side um, what they look like. This is not the hardest example, of course, given that we're modifying such a small region of the, of the compound. Um, but again, you are you have complete control over um, how much of the original compound you elect uh, to be um, modifiable. Um, I can run HTTP, uh, HTTPK again and just show the um, change in the, um, uh, the predicted oral bioavailability. Um, Michael, I think, showed this feature, but if you're interested in sort of looking into what the cause might be for that increased um, oral bioavailability prediction, um, I think Michael showed this actually. Um, in the atomic properties window, if I select, um, this is the sum of our recombinant SIP uh, clearances, um, so the sum of our RSIP models, the intrinsic clearance models, um, it shows for the original compound three sites uh, of metabolism with reasonably high intrinsic clearance values. If I hover over here, it shows me the units are in um, microliter per minute per milligram uh, microsomal protein. So these are numbers, you know, one and above 50. Um, if I show the final structure, here, the same three sites are identified, um, but the intrinsic clearances that are predicted are much, much smaller for this compound. Um, it's likely due to the um, lower log P of this compound, um, which we, we predict. Um, okay, um, my clock is showing 25 uh, after. Um, I think I will stop here. Again, we um, will have webinars that are dedicated uh, both to the full AdMet Predictor 10 version uh, and to the AIDD feature in particular. Um, so I think for now, uh, Michael and I will stop and um, we're happy to uh, take any questions that you might have. Thank you, David. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. I especially enjoyed the, the AIDD, uh, it was very nice. Um, so we do have a couple questions that uh, people have typed in, and uh, I'll try and go through these fairly quickly. Uh, so the first question is: Can log p changes happen during that happen during pregnancy be modeled uh, to build a PBPK model? Uh, yes, the um, you know we take just the 2D structure in AdMet Predictor, and we can predict uh, log d versus pH. 
uh, and sort of get that as a, a profile. And then uh, this could be, this is used in, in Gastro Plus. So Gastro Plus has a pregnancy model. And of course, uh, I'm sure log D uh, is very important in that model. And uh, well, we, we, we can model that. So that's, a, I think, a, a new model that was added into Gastro Plus uh, 9.7. Uh, the next question is, are all the modules uh, part of a single license of AdMap Predictor? or each one needs to be bought separately? Uh, the answer is uh, yes, they all can be bought separately uh, or as well, one package. And this gives you a lot of flexibility. Incidentally, what we're gonna do with the um, transporter module is that there were several uh, models built into uh, transporter models that were already in uh, the PhysChem and biopharmaceutical properties module of AdMet Predictor. We're gonna move all those to the transporter module, uh, but anyone that currently has a license of AdMet Predictor uh, will get the transporter module um, uh, included in their, their, their purchase uh, for one year. Uh, the next question is, uh, does solubility consider uh, pH? Uh, yes, we have a model called uh, S plus uh, uh, pH, and that's what we, uh, when I dis displayed the uh, uh, pH versus, um, or the solubility versus pH profile, that is uh, the model that's being used. So that's this uh, S plus pH, or excuse me, the S plus S underscore pH model. So that's at a particular pH. So these were all performed at pH 7.4. Uh, if I click on the ADMET property calculation, that's specified here. So if I go to 1.5, let's say where it'd be more uh, similar to what would be in the um, uh, stomach, uh, then you can see that the um, pH or the, the, the solubility is much higher for this one with the morpholine ring uh, as kind of demonstrated when we uh, did the example there. Um, let's see, we have a question about gut microbiome. Uh, and how that would contribute to the pharmacokinetics of a drug uh, candidate. That's more of a, um, a gastro plus question, but as far as I know, I, I don't believe that um, uh, we, we model the, the gut microbiome right now in uh, gastro plus, but um, uh, you might ask someone that knows a little bit more about gastro plus than, than myself. Uh, and then another question is, what is the number in brackets? So, uh, specifically, I'll go to the transporter module, and uh, we can look at uh, predictions for the various uh, models. So uh, if we look at these uh, two models here, the number in parentheses is the classification model, and the number in parentheses is the confidence we have in that prediction. Our models are based on 33 artificial neural networks, so it's not a single neural network. And we plot, uh, we, we get the uncertainty from the uh, actual number of models that agree. So for example, if um, when we build the model, if a compound has 33 of the networks that agree, either yes or no, uh, then we would have a lot of confidence in that prediction. Whereas if, uh, 17 of the models say it's a positive and 16 say negative, uh, then we would have lower confidence in there. And that's just kind of a little bit of how that's uh, calculated in here. And then uh, for regression models, uh, in this version, we've changed this up a little bit from ADMET predictor uh, um, 9.5. Uh, here we're showing the range of values. So for this BCEP, I see 50 values uh, for this. Uh, one sigma de deviation would go between 13 and 83. And it just depends how this model was built. Uh, this was built in log space. So the regression model is in uh, log space. And so this would be a log distribution uh, around this value. And it's uh, uh, basically one sigma uh, deviation around that predicted value. And again, it comes from analyzing the um, individual neural networks in there. Uh, and then typically what we uh, say for regression models is if the confidence estimate is below 60%, that that's kind of an uncertain 
uh, prediction. So we see here for OAT3 substrate, these two, um, we're saying really that the model's kind of uncertain because the confidence is less than 60%. Now, you know, this one leans towards yes and this one leans towards no. Uh, we would generally recommend that if it's below 60, you get an experimental uh, value for that because it's kind of uh, undecided. Um, so that's uh, kind of our general uh, take on uh, uncertainty. Uh, so I appreciate everyone's questions and uh, just want to thank everyone for attending and staying on the line for an hour and a half. And uh, if you have any questions, you can direct those to your uh, distributor at your site. And um, we're happy. Uh, you could also email uh, David or myself and we'd be happy to answer any questions. So uh, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, David, would you like to say any uh, concluding remarks? Only that we look forward to seeing everyone again tomorrow. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye-bye everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye.